So hello, everyone. Um, it's good to see uh, a Python track in this conference. <laughs> Um, so, indeed, I'm going to talk about some different uses of Python, so why Python is so popular, um, with some different examples, some of them uh, a mix of videos and live coding, so uh, be prepared for everything. Um, first, hello, welcome. Let me introduce myself, so um, I'm Céline. I'm a French Londoner. Um, this is a picture of me when Python was three years old. So, <laughs> yes, that was <laughs> that's all I'm going to say. Um, after that, so I graduated from an engineering school in France. Hello again. And um, I worked for quite a few years, uh, for seven years actually, in Aldebrun, which is now SoftBank Robotics, um, a French robotics company um, that creates robots like um, this now robot here and also a bigger one called Pepper. Um, I'll talk a bit more about it um, later on. Um, and three years ago, I decided to move to London um, and now I work at Ocado. Anybody is familiar with Ocado? <laughs> A colleague here. <laughs> um, <laughs> so it's uh, basically there's Okado Retail, which is an online supermarket in the UK, and Okado Technology is the company that powers everything behind it. Um, there's actually a Krakow branch. Um, hi. <laughs> uh, basically, I don't work for the retail bit at all, actually. We work for coding games to teach computing to children and to actually help teachers teach, basically, which is part of Okado's corporate responsibility. Uh, and guess what? In all of those projects, I've uh, been using Python. First, let me state something. So I'm going to obviously tell you why Python is great and everybody should use Python and it's amazing, but let's keep in mind it's not a war. It's not a war between languages. We have other tracks in this conference with other languages and everything is valid. Um, so it's, I don't know if you know the gorilla versus shark questions. It's like who would win a fight, a gorilla or a shark? And it's a sort of questions that might be funny but are usually a bit pointless. Uh, and if you translate them into programming languages, it's even more pointless. So there's an article you can read on, uh, on Stack Overflow, which is really interesting about that, like how to phrase questions, because it's okay if you want to know, for instance, which language you should use for like a specific usage or what is better for like a specific uh, frame, basically. But if you say, oh, is it Perl of Python? That's a bit pointless. So let's bear in mind that and not shame any other languages, even if Python is really amazing. Um, as an example, that was like earlier this year, I went to PyCon UK. Who was in PyCon UK? Me, okay. Um, <laughs> it was in Cardiff, it was amazing. A uh, huge Python community, but at some point during one talk, um, a speaker said that they were a .NET developer and a few members of the audience started to boo. You know, like in primary school, like boo. Um, and it was reported as part of the code of conduct breach. And people in the Python community are usually very, uh, try to make it good and not like being basically um, not no good people. Let's say that. Uh, that said, um, this is. I'm not sure if it's that very readable, but then you can go on the Redmonk website after. This is just a graph um, that tries to say how uh, popular programming languages are. Uh, it's based on both the popularity rank on GitHub by a number of projects, uh, and also on Stack Overflow, like number of tags and things like that. And you can see Python is right uh, on the top, so it's pretty popular with some other languages. Um, Stack Overflow again has some very interesting blog posts about um, the popularity of Python. Uh, it actually, I would read those articles because they're really read in depth about uh, the popularity and why, and try to get a lot of different um, figures to prove that point. Uh, but anyway, this is the growth of uh, programming languages um, in World Bank high income countries based on Stack Overflow questions. Um, so that's a metric that we might or not agree with. There's, they talk about it in the article. But you can see that um, Python has overcome um, JavaScript and Java like last year or something like that. Uh, and you can see this growth looks quite, quite interesting, right? Um, this is in non-high income countries and Python is not that popular, but the growth is really 
good as well. So that has quite a growth. Um, another graph that shows that Python is like really popular and actually growing as well. So uh, if we stop for a moment, obviously popularity doesn't have to mean that it's great or amazing, right? So yeah, this is expect some more <laughs> XKCD <laughs> graph. So um, they say um, we should be done with the sandwich thing by 2024. I think we're already done, or is it still a thing, the sandwich, the definition of a sandwich thing? It was a thing, definitely. But yeah, this is just trends, basically, and trends is just what it is. A trend doesn't have to mean that what you're talking about is such an interesting topic, for instance. Um, however, I would argue that popularity in terms of, for instance, programming language, it does mean like um, a bigger community and what goes with bigger community, so better updates, um, people to share with, etc. Um, so I've just put uh, the, the, well, the Python implementation on GitHub and the link because that's where people contribute to Python. So a shootout to a few communities. <laughs> so I've put the <laughs> Krakow user groups. Um, who's a member of a um, Python user group or goes regularly to meetups or conferences? Oh, quite a few. Um, for the other ones, uh, if it's something that you would like, I would recommend it because it's a good way to network with uh, other Python developers, uh, whichever level that you are in. Um, and it's yeah, a good way to learn, but also yeah, to network and to just be part of this amazing community. So um, a shout out to a few communities I really like. Some of them are sort of <laughs> London specific. Um, yeah, but this one is the Krakow user group. So if we go back in time um, as to what makes Python really good and was it like something that was sort of written from scratch. So um, I found a few um, quotes by Guido van Rossum. Um, so what you can see, the background is apparently the old Python logo, by the way. It looks amazing, right? Just, I like Python. Um, <laughs> so apparently, at the beginning, Python was just a way to sort of um, bridge the gaps between the shell and C. Um, they were using, at that time, a language called um, ABC. Um, and they did borrow a few best bits of this language, basically, which is why um, I guess Python from the from the start was actually already pretty um, versatile. Um, something else, which is about packages, because um, they really so he says um, so we written they, they thought at the beginning they would write only small Python scripts basically small bits of code but um, in the end uh, there was the possibility of create your own uh, libs etc and they created a way to of packages so that's why also there's this whole community around Python which is made easy um, by the programming language itself. Um, so if we go into more details about Python, for instance, it's readability. So this is another <laughs> comic I really like. You're flying, how? Python. I learned it last night. Everything is so simple. Hello world is just print hello world. I don't know, dynamic typing, white space. Come join us, programming is fun again. It's a whole new world up here. But how are you flying? I just type import anti-gravity. <laughs> um, <laughs> <laughs> I, okay, that's what, I'm, that's what I'm going to say. Um, it's actually part of the Zen of Python, which you can read on Python website. Um, readability counts, um, so it's all about you know writing beautiful code. Um, simple is better than complex, etc. Um, so it's really like part of the philosophy of the language. Uh, this is an example of Hello Krakow, because it's better than Hello World here. <laughs> uh, in <laughs> and in Python, as you said. So, oh, yeah, that's my robot in Krakow a few years ago, by the way, <laughs> saying Hello Krakow. So, yeah. Uh, something else, obviously. So, yeah, clear indentation is something that makes it really well because you don't have to program in such a mess. You really have to use indentation to. Uh, make your to make your code work. Um, also, Python does uh, support lots of different paradigms, so it's like really versatile. Um, large standard library, automatic memory management. So uh, that's like some of the ideas as to why Python may be really used. Um, oh yeah. So in terms of that, um, if you go on PyPy, which is where you've got um, community-made packages. Um, 
when I wrote this slide, which, <laughs> yes, it was last week, <laughs> you can see there were 154,838 projects. But if we go now on the website, you can see that um, there are how many? 500 more? Yeah. Yes, nearly a thousand more, uh, and a few more users as well. Um, and that was, I said, like a few a few days ago, like the 11th. What day are we in today? 15th? Yes. So, just so we can have a more details into which domains, like which use of Python, make its growth. Because now we know that its readability, its versatility, makes it like easy to pick on and to use. So, which domains exactly? Uh, make Python really more popular now. So quite consistently, web development is quite high, but the main growth comes from um, data science, uh, machine learning, etc., uh, which we can have a look a bit later. Um, so this is just a few logos of Django and Flask, which uh, we actually use in our current project to do some web developments with Python. Uh, something else which is really used for is obviously education because of its simplicity. Oh, so if we go back to the graph, maybe not this one, one of the other graphs, they found out as well that um, you can see in the other languages there are a lot of seasonal spikes, and it actually comes as well from probably education, and that's why it's quite seasonal. However, Python, the growth is steady and not really seasonal. It's because it's also using academia, which is less seasonal than just learning. Um, so there are more like, details on Stack Overflow there. I thought that was quite an interesting point. So if we go back to education here, it just says that in the US, basically, um, Python is really one of the most taught languages in introductory courses. Uh, some other projects that you can find, um, who knows the BBC Microbit? Okay, a few people. Are you Googling it right now? Is that way? <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, so the BBC Microbit uh, is just like really a tiny computer-like um, tool that children, especially in the UK, can use to learn the basics of programming. So you can see uh, it has like different um, inputs and outputs, and here, um, there are people that actually written a version of Python uh, so it can be used on this device, which is called MicroPython. I think it's also open source as well. Um, and for instance, here you would just say um, display dot scroll hello world. And actually what would happen is that here you would have all the letters being displayed one by one on the left. So it's like quite a long hello world, but it works. Um, and for the children, it really makes a really grounded way to learn the concept as well. So I would recommend checking that children, if you have children or not, basically. Um, as I said, the other interesting bit is all around data processing, uh, machine learning, etc. So this is just a few um, logos. Um, so I think we talked in one of the previous talk about Jupyter Notebooks, for instance, which we really use in the data science community. Um, you can run snippets of code there. It's really a good way to document things. Um, the pandas, which is data analytics, which is being really used. So if you look at the previous graph, pandas was like whoo, spiking. Um, Scikit-learn to do some machine learning quite easily. Um, and later on, I will show you a small example written with um, an LTK, which does like language um, analysis, natural language processing. Uh, and obviously NumPy um, for... Um, I don't have words anymore. You know them by, right? Yay, okay, good. <laughs> oh, yes, so something I forget is that it's not all about Python. I was just typing pandas to find the logo, and I was like, oh, yeah, pandas. <laughs> it's not just about Python, it's actually a thing. It's just a joke. Um, so now we can go to a few, I would say, a few more um, examples. Um, some examples I would want to talk about are come from um, the robots. So I didn't bring my robot in today because it was really complicated. I really wanted to, I'm sorry. Um, so hopefully some videos will work and some links. So this is just an example on how you can use um, Python um, to create robotic applications. Um, and some of them actually have like real, obviously real world um, examples. So. I'm going to actually open to 
to open a software called Choreograph, which you're going to see after. So yeah, this is Choreograph. So this is a tool I was using for seven years when I was working at Aldebrun to program applications on a robot. So this is a virtual robot. So things should sort of run on this robot, not everything. but. Um, and basically, it's quite simple. You program using um, boxes, but the boxes are scripted in Python inside. And you can actually import a lot of stuff there, so it's quite okay. And you can also do your own animations, um, so you can really program a complete robotic behavior from scratch using this tool. So for instance, if I import a recent project, yeah. Um, so this is, uh, for instance, just a um, few uh, project which is called language detection. So basically, um, I use this to detect the written language of a text. Um, so it uses the three grams method. I don't know if you're familiar with the three grams method. Anybody is familiar? Okay. Basically, you sort of stem your, your words into groups of three letters and you slide it down, basically, and you just have um, a dictionary of the most used trigram in a language. For instance, in English, the is really common, as well as a, or um, things like that. Uh, and in, in Polish, I don't know what that would be. But, what? <laughs> SZ and some, <laughs> SZY, I don't know. I have no idea, but it would be interesting. But you can see already how it's different because the languages sound different, right? And basically, you use that as a way to test your sentences against that and guess what's the most probable language. Uh, it works as a method because even if you have uh, spelling mistakes and stuff like that, it's quite resilient. It's better than using a, a dictionary, for instance. And you can introduce some words from another language, like you can speak in Polish about an English uh, music band, for instance, that would sort of work most of the time. Um, so this is, I've just programmed that in Python quite quite quickly. I don't know if you're going to see anything. Um, where is it? Oh! So I double click on the box and then you've got the script somewhere. It's not readable, right? Yo, it docks everywhere. <laughs> don't undock, please. <laughs> Um, yeah, so you can see there are not a lot of lines of code, and I'm using um, a lib that I've put there. Um, it's really quite simple. The way it works is the inputs will call a function, and then you can just output the name of your output. You can return the name of your output, and that's the way to deal with um, doing through all your boxes. So it's quite simple. And here, for instance, if I run the project, so it goes through all the different uh, sets. Um, here, I just didn't link to anything, so I can just click on one of the other examples. Um, do you know the Jabberwocky by Lewis Carroll? So it's a, a poem written in um, the second book of Alice in Wonderland, which is, in, I think, which is in gibberish. So it does sound English, but it's pure gibberish. Um, and I've put the French translation of the Jabberwocky as well. I'm French, hello. And you can see that it will recognize the language. So here, um, well, you didn't see the robot says this is English, even if it's gibberish, but it's English gibberish, and this is French. And I could put any sort of sentence here, it would work. Um, so you can see that's just sort of really quick to prototype an example like that. Um, and so something that we were using it for I can't find my... Okay. Uh, so yeah, that's the video of me giving a talk um, in, in Warsaw about um, choreographs, so you can watch it later if I share the slides. Um, something which actually made it really useful is that um, I was working on a project for children with autism. 
Um, basically, which is good with the robot is that first, um, those kids were really interested in technology in general, but also it's a good way to bridge the gap between, for instance, teachers would use a, a tablet or um, apps on a phone. And um, it's slightly better if you want to then sort of um, learn on human beings, for instance. For instance, uh, emotion recognition is much easier to learn on a robot and then apply your knowledge on a human being that learn with smileys on the phone and stuff like that. Um, also, the robot uh, is non-judgmental. So it's really a good way for... Um, it was really a good app and a good tool for the teachers, usually. So if we have time for a video... shape the path and become a part of the journey. So the good thing with Python is that it helps us do, a, do that in a really short time. So in um, two weeks, we had a new app from scratch um, and tested uh, in QA as well. So that actually have do like about 50 apps for children um, in a span of, uh, I think, in quite um, a short amount of time. So we also had um, a, a web app actually in Django <laughs> um, to help the teachers create playlists of apps like that. Um, so I guess without um, this choreograph tool and scripting in Python and the easiness of importing libs, etc., that wouldn't have happened. Um, so that's actually a concrete example of how Python can help. Um. Um, so yes, if we go back to, for instance, natural language processing. So I was showing you this example about um, the language detection and something else that I did to play around. Um, so do you know Markov chains? Can you raise your hands if you know Markov chains? Okay, not everybody. So, ah, cool, I forgot. Where are you? I've got slides at the back just for that. <laughs> Prepare. <laughs> so, basically, the idea is to sort of um, predict or make like a sentence, for instance, um, out of um, probabilities. So you would, for instance, analyze a text um, 
This is a text that I actually have written on my blog, and the idea is that here you do it with three, but you sort of um, create um, an idea of which words are going to be after, for instance, two words. So, for instance, the doors can be uh, followed by the word off, um, doors off will be followed by the, and so you analyze all your texts um, if you want to create, uh, for instance, something that sounds like me when I write. So the way I say that is that the output will be me being drunk, <laughs> um, writing some surreal poetry, for instance. Um, and then you end up with like probabilities. So for instance, uh, the doors have a probability of 80% to be followed by off, 10% of leading, the doors leading, uh, or the doors to, etc. And so you've got, and then what you do is that you just basically pick, um, pick at random, uh, ponderated random, weighted random. Um, and you can do a lot of um, crazy things with that. So, sorry, a lot of um, interesting things with that. So, that's. Let's go back to this example. So, I've done that so that it's, it's more fun when the robot is speaking gibberish. So, this is choreograph again. Um, actually, most of the things are written here. So if I try to run it directly, I will have a problem. I think. Yes. Um, one issue is that this thing uh, doesn't exist for the virtual robot, so I have to sort of correct it. Um, so here, what I'm going to do is just um, I can't see anything, so if you don't mind me, I'm going to correct it there. But basically, oh, I did. OK, I had done that. I sort of override this box by just saying yes all the time. So usually I would ask the robot, like the robot would ask me, do you want to hear something new? And I would say yes or no. But here I can't really do that, so I just put yes in the loop. So, okay, so now it's running. So it's stuck here because basically it's waiting to see a face, which is something you can do with this robot. Um, so I'm going to sort of manually fake that there's been someone. And the robot is going to wave, and here it should say something, doesn't it? Okay, no, just waves. Oh, hello, I'm a robot, nice to meet you. Okay. I'm going to tell you a surreal poem. Okay, so you can't really see anything, so I'm going to show you other examples. So you can do it, so actually I've done it with words and also with trigrams. So with trigrams, you generate gibberish as in the Jabberwocky, like fake English, uh, which sounds English but is not English, and with words, it just sounds very surreal. So for instance, in with the trigrams, I found new words like peacockney or spectangular, um, so it creates a lot of funny things like that. So that's uh, one example. Ah, spoilers, sorry. <laughs> yeah, so you can find a full talk of things like that uh, that I presented last year um, here. So Moving on to other topics, um, we were talking about education and web development as well. So that's a current example of um, Code for Life. So I told you a bit about um, Ocado at the beginning and what we do at Code for Life. Um, so Ocado actually decided to start this project um, to teach computing to children in 2014 because that's when the UK put uh, computing in the primary school curriculum. I'd say the UK is actually um, England and Wales. Um, this is the pictures actually of past and current um, team members. Um, so we do have a small full-time team as well as volunteers, like my check one volunteer from Okado Krakow. Um, and I want to thank all those guys. So they've been like uh, interns, uh, volunteers, uh, and a full-time team member as well. Um, so all of these people have been dedicating to help the project grow, and we're also open source, so have a quite uh, 
not a lot of people helping on GitHub, but we do have people helping with our translations, for instance, as well, from people we don't know. Um, yeah, we've got an open translation platform. The game is available in English, and he's actually been fully translated in Turkish as well, and it's nearly ready in uh, Spanish, Catalan, Italian, um, probably Polish and French as well. Yeah, people are like, why is it not translated in French? Yes, because reasons. Um, so I'm sorry. So that's quite the, the history of the project. Uh, and the first game we've been, um, we had been doing, uh, actually before my time at Okado, but it's called uh, Rapid Rotor. And it teaches to primary school children. So, so I had slides just in case the website doesn't, uh, doesn't work, but it's going to be better if I show you. Um, so this is our main website called For Life, which is done with Django. And if I play, so I say everything is like free, so you can play even without being registered. It's better to register an account as a, either a teacher or an independent student. You put a few more perks, but everything is, um, is free, so you can do it. So the way we teach, we try to, so actually the teachers, um, they sometimes at a loss to sort of teach the kids um, the concepts. Um, for instance, the need of like repeat statements or if statements uh, and the logical thinking bit that sometimes they struggle more rather than the syntax. However, they also have issues with the syntax, which is um, sometimes, for instance, they think they know the basics of Python, but they don't really. Um, and it can be a bit difficult to also apply their knowledge from one language to another, etc. So we're sort of trying to help the teachers a bit with that. So the way it starts, can you sort of see? Okay, so here it just says move forwards. So if I put the block here, um, the van should move one step forwards. And that's done. So here, um, children don't, don't actually realize it's programming because it's just putting a block, right? So what happens is, if I go to, let's say, level 12, Um, you still have like quite a few number of blocks, so forwards, left, etc. Um, however, the road gets really complicated, so it becomes to be a bit painful to to like try to find out the patterns and uh, copy paste everything 200 times. So I'm not going to do it. Which is why later on, when we introduce repeat loops. Um, it sort of makes sense because it becomes grounded. It's not just something the teacher says and they're like, yes, whatever. Um, they sort of need the concept to simplify their life and playing the game, right? Um, so there are also videos uh, with people from Okado Technology talking about their, their job as well. So it also grounds like, like, you know, what programming can lead to and sort of motivates and inspire them to become um, software engineers, for instance, or at least have an interest in it. And then they would explain the concept. So here, Mahana would explain uh, the concept of uh, four loops, etc. Um, and here, yes, you're like, oh, at last, I've got a repeat loop, so I can just move this block. I think that's too much. Three might be enough. So yeah. Woohoo! Great. And so after all of that, they learn a few more things. Um, and the older kids uh, are learning Python. So what we did is that introduce something called um, introduction to Python. Which is uh, apparently one of the main features that teachers like most about um, our games. Because here, you start by still programming in Blockly, but it translates into Python. So you can see here, there's like one more line. So they sort of get familiar with it. So later on, they can do the same. Um, sorry. <laughs> Which means that then they can be ready to program in Python.
So here you can write directly in Python, and if you forget, um, you've got like the commands you can use in the game, but you have to remember uh, for and if, etc. So, and here, oh, it's already there. Okay. Yay! So that's um, quite useful for primary school. Now the problem is that you can see the problem between writing this bit of code and understanding this one, which is a screenshot for our code base at some point uh, uh, in the project's life. <laughs> um, some of the things they might not understand. Here, for instance, they import a van, um, and they would use the, the van to move around, but they might not really understand what that actually means. And here you've got more imports, uh, a mix of um, imports from uh, Django, but also imports from our own project, things like that. Um, they might not really get difference. Um, the only thing I found with uh, beginners, for instance, it is difficult to understand what comes from um, the project itself, a local API, or that comes from uh, the Python standard library, for instance. It can be a bit difficult, and that's the same. They just When you start, you don't really know what you can access. Um, same, they don't really learn object-oriented programming. Here you've got classes, they might not know what that means, etc. So we are introducing a new game called AI MMO, um, which has changed a lot since the last time I talked about it. Uh, which is, so it uses Django, but also a lot of other things. So this is a multiplayer game. Same, I'll try to show you on the website. So this is the what the game currently looks like. So what happens is that uh, it's multiplayer. So if a teacher creates like um, a school and with classes, um, they will all be able to access their games, but they can't access the games created in other schools, for instance. Something we wanted to do at the beginning, but we found out it might be really scary and prevent them from learning, because that means literally anyone uh, could just log in the game, even like a 40-year-old Python developer that knows everything and would sort of win everything, and that would be a bit uh, unfair for the children. Um, so here, this is a game that um, I created. So usually, there is a map here. Oh, so you can see the made with Unity, so it's indeed made with Unity. Okay. Um, and I'll try to find myself. <laughs> Sounds very philosophical. Where am I? Oh, look, I'm here. So yeah, I've got like a blue dot on my head um, that shows it's me. If other players would join the game from the school, they would appear as well, but without the blue triangle on their head. So. And here you've got pickups. This is like a, a health pickup. It disappeared. Okay, bye. <laughs> um, and you just program on a turn-based system, so you need to program an intelligence to program your avatar. So it, each turn of the game, it knows what to do. Um, so for instance, uh, you can say here, move, uh, move at random, or you can try to um, pick a specific direction, etc. And you can also, at some point, optimize to find the pickups or even attack other players and things like that. So it really teaches more advanced uh, Python programming as well as some uh, basics of obstacle avoidance, etc. Uh, and we are refining it right now. So we are probably going to open the preview to selected users soon. Um, and we use Flask as well, as well as Kubernetes. So everything uh, run in Kubernetes. Um, and the front end, we use uh, React uh, and uh, Unity for um, the map, as you can see. So it's quite a, quite a big project, and we all open source. So yeah, if you want to know more about this project, there are a few links, um, especially our GitHub. And as a thank you, a few cute <laughs> snakes with hats. Thank you very much, and if you've got questions, 
we've got three minutes. <laughs> Thank you for your presentation. And I wanted to ask about like more challenging approach with the, uh, I forgot the project, when you code and you have the, the avatar going on, more like uh, not even in, in classrooms, but w with developers that want to try themselves and uh, yeah. like, uh, um, w m uh, I forgot the word, uh, Compete, compete to, to and to, to change themselves. Is there a way, like, to are you planning maybe to, to launch it somewhere on the side, beside the, the education side? Uh, we're not sure yet. The thing is that it's actually possible to do it because you can register as a teacher even if you're not a teacher. <laughs> <laughs> so you can create your own school and put uh, other people as <laughs> players, basically, and then you can definitely do what you want. So right now you can import what you want. Um, so it's possible to have a play around. The main uh, users right now is really like um, children in schools and teenagers, but definitely there's a way to obviously tweak that. Yeah. Okay, thanks. I forgot to show you an example, by the way. But <laughs> if you're interested, I've got an example using NLTK that I forgot to show you um, on Google Colab with Jupyter Notebooks, but if you're interested, I can show you. Um, so it's just an example, which is something that didn't run really well on the robot, but it's actually easy to show it on the side. So I use NLTK to do something which I call the uh, inverting songs and poems. So it's a crazy, it's a, it's um, it's an idea that um, I had like a few years ago with a friend, and we started to manually start to find um, how you would invert a song, for instance, so find vocabulary and find the antonym of it. Um, and that would create something quite funny. And then we obviously started to brainstorm about what it means to find the antonym of every word, like what would be the antonym of a robot, for instance, what would be the antonym of a chair. And we ended up finding definitions and uh, <laughs> finding the antonym, so the contrary of each word, uh, sort of recursively until you, <laughs> you have something which is complete nonsense. Uh, and obviously we were doing it manually and then we're like, we need to automatize that and we never did and I did it last year <laughs> with NLTK. So um, NLTK allows you to download a few packages with dictionaries and that allows to also um, stem your sentences and find out, for instance, if a, if a word is being used as a noun or a verb because sometimes it, and so it gets it easy to sort of find out, for instance, an antonym of a word, but you can have like the antonym as a noun or the antonym as an adjective depending on um, the language. And here, um, do you, I can show you after because I'm not sure. Uh, I can try, but um, it's still very, it's a bit more readable. I'm just a bit ashamed of my code, that's it. But, uh, <laughs> but well, you can see it's quite, it's quite simple. And so the idea is really just uh, as I described the algorithm I described. And um, the way I've done it is you can actually choose uh, the depths of recursion. So for instance, you can just find just like the synonyms or you can go into the definition and antonymize for the, the antonyms or you can go even deeper um, so here um, you can, so for instance, which sentence do you want? You can tell me. <laughs> so I can do it with like a depth of two and start with that. S say farewell to Krakow. So there's no antonym to Krakow, but the next bit, we might be able to find it if we go to three. It will try to find a definition. I have no idea what's going to happen, so. <laughs> Say farewell to a non-industrial city in northern Poland on the Vist. <laughs> <laughs> so that's just the definition. <laughs> um, four, because I want to know more. <laughs> Say farewell to a non-industrial, a small and thinly populated rural area in, nor in, north in the Northern Republic. Wait, wait, wait. 
in the Northern Republic or in peripheral Europe <laughs> on a European river. <laughs> And so the next bit will also enter, so we can go as far as we want. <laughs> um, yeah, Python, amazing. <laughs> Do we have any other questions from the audience? Okay, I think that would be it. Thank you very much for the call. Thank you.